Hey everyone, on this episode of Noon, meet Lindsay, a dynamic force in the world of EMS. As a seasoned flight paramedic and a dedicated paramedic instructor, Lindsay brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to both the skies and the classroom. Beyond her roles in traditional EMS settings, Lindsay is also making waves as an influencer, utilizing platforms like Instagram to share meticulously researched and valuable EMS content. She not only prepares the next generation of paramedics, but also supports her community through informative posts. Join us for a captivating conversation as Lindsay discusses her multifaceted career, blending the high stakes environment of flight paramedicine with the nuanced art of paramedic instruction in the digital realm of influencer education. This episode promises to be an insightful exploration of Lindsay's impactful contributions to the EMS community. Let's get started. All right, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us on the Noon Podcast today. I am so happy to have you out here. I don't want to throw myself out too much, but I am fangirling so hard right now. <laughs> oh, God, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, you're a big inspiration for a lot of us. And, you know, I did talk to you a little bit off screen about how much your work is giving us so much valuable information and, and doing so much good for our community. So thank you so much. Um, can I go ahead and get an introduction? Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me and thanks for the kind words. I will never stop being completely awkward when people tell me they're like fangirling over my Instagram. It's just been like such a weird experience. Someone told me that on a scene flight the other day and I just like curled up in a ball. But anyway, um, (laughs) my name is Lindsay Ewing. Um, Some of you may know me from Instagram, the pre-hospitalist handle. Um, But I work full time as a critical care flight paramedic in Virginia. And then I work part time as a paramedic program coordinator and instructor. That's fantastic. I didn't know you were an instructor. That makes a lot more sense with how you're getting (laughs) all of your information. I don't know how you do it, girl. You post uh, and I don't know how often you post, but you post a lot. Like every time I open, I'm like, oh, the pre-hospitalist, that's the first one on my page for me to give a like to. (laughs) So full disclosure, I have both anxiety and unmedicated ADHD. And so I actually find that Instagram is like an amazing coping mechanism for that. So like, I'm not good at doing nothing or like having downtime. And so, I mean, I'll get bored, like being on the Stairmaster at the gym or like on the leg of a dead leg of a flight or something. And I use that time to do posts because writing comes very easy to me. I enjoy it so I can crank out a post in like 20 minutes. Um, So basically all my little snippets of downtime I use to just, you know, find something to talk about. No, that's fantastic. And at least you're utilizing that time in a healthy way. Like I play games, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I'm on (laughs) on my dead legs playing Royal match and I don't want to expose myself, but in the fairness of being raw, I will admit that I'm on like level over 5,000. So that's. (laughs) Hey, I think you should be proud of that and you should own it. I don't know about that. (laughs) I don't know about that, but I'll, you know what? I'll take it. I'll take it. (laughs) That is so neat. The, what a cool thing. It really is original the way that you're doing it too, because when you and I first talked to you, it said that you didn't want to post the same thing 20 times over and over and over again. And you don't really like literally every time I open up my phone it's a different subject yeah i try and i it's it's evolved this was the day after christmas was the third year anniversary of that page that's when i started it three years ago and it's really evolved over the last few years and it's changed kind of quite a bit but i just enjoy taking material from everywhere in my life i take it from my own history with ground 911 and calls that I run there and calls that I still run there. I take it from flights that I do. Um, and then I get a lot of it from the classroom too. I mean, I spend, I spend a lot of my days where I'm not working in a classroom and that creates a lot of discussion and questions. And I get the opportunity to see where the weaknesses are and where the confusion is. And I really enjoy just picking out these little like niche topics and little kind of like micro pieces of education to just dive into and that people can hopefully read when they have a few minutes of downtime. 
Yeah, no, it does. You do make it very easy and very simple to to read and educate oneself in that short period, brief of time where I have ADHD as well. And I tend to scroll quite a bit, but I usually stop and read and it's good information. Like you're you're learning new things every time and it's really good, like really, really good. Um, how long have you been a paramedic for? Um, so my history is kind of lengthy and confusing because in my state, we have, we used to have in Virginia, multiple different levels. So in 2006, when I was in high school, I got my EMT certification and I was, um, volunteering in high school, which is terrifying. And we can talk about that. And then I chose my college based on the rescue squad that was there because they were super busy and all volunteer and I knew I wanted to do that. So while I was in college, I got my um, EMT enhanced, which is kind of similar to the AEMT now. Um, so I had that for a few years and then I got my EMT intermediate, which was considered medic, um, which where I practiced was the same scope as paramedic um, with the exception of things like Craig. And then eventually I moved up to my paramedic as well. Um, so overall, I've been in it since 2006 and I've had my medic for um, a while. <laughs> That's crazy. So like your whole growing up and your basically your whole identity has been in EMS. It's been like, it's been a really huge part, I think, of my development as a human. And when I was younger, because I started when I was like, I consider myself a child at the time. Yes. Like at that, at that point in my life, it was my identity. I was such a fucking dweeb. Like I thought I was so cool. I had, I had sweatpants that said EMT on them that oh I bought my for gosh. myself. I like I sprinted to the DMV to get my rescue squad license plates. Um, I would like wear my fire rescue shirt in public. And it was, you know, in hindsight, horribly embarrassing. Um, but when when you're a child that's like figuring out who you are and like you're trying to just be cool, that's that's what happens, right? Um, but it's turned over the years as I have grown up in this world has turned into being way less of my identity, but contributing to my perspective of the world a lot more in both good and bad ways. But I would say a lot more in, in a positive light and just contributing to like seeing the humanity and like people and how people live and being able to empathize more and like being appreciative for what you have and those sorts of things. So yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for that part of it for sure. And you, you said that it was mostly positive, but a little negative also. Can you enlighten us on that? What do you mean by negative? Oh yeah. I think, um, and you know, I've been very open about this on Instagram with my like therapy journey. Right. So I don't feel like I don't have PTSD, right, from this job. Have I gone through bouts of PTSD? Yes, absolutely. But do I have it as a long-term thing? Absolutely not. Um, but over the last year, I have kind of come to terms with the fact that this job has had impacts on me that I've kind of been ignoring for a lot of years. I've always told myself I handled this job well, I'm fine with the trauma. And all those things are true. Like I really do have great coping mechanisms. I have a great support network, but I've started to realize that the amount of health anxiety I have, um, that's the number one issue is not, it's not normal where I spend my days constantly worrying about the worst case scenario with my own health, my husband's health, my stepkids health, my, my parents' health, everyone around me. I mean, I get, you know, some shortness of breath and it's a PE or my husband has a headache and it's a subarachnoid or, you know, my dad has abdominal pain and it's cancer. And like, this is how my brain was working every single day. And I just, it had become my normal. It had absolutely become my normal. And one day I was like, you know what? I think that maybe this is not normal. And so I decided to make the leap and start therapy. And it has been like, the best decision I think I've ever made in my adult life. And I'm a few months in at this point of going um, weekly and it has made like huge, huge impacts on my life and my mental health. And then I would say the other um, kind of negative impact of the job is like immense distrust, distrust in the healthcare system. 
And that has gotten significantly worse since I've started flying. I'm still a baby flight medic. I'm in my fourth year now. Um, and I still consider myself like very new to critical care. But just in that short time, I have seen so much piss poor, awful shit care from providers at all levels that I am literally terrified to go to a hospital. And I've always felt that way a little bit, even, you know, when I was working regular, you know, career ground 911, you know, I would see this, but you're transporting to a lot fewer hospitals and you get a lot less exposure. You know, I currently fly to three different states on a regular basis. Um, and so you get a lot of exposure at a lot of different places. And I just, I think that healthcare professionals get away with a lot because we don't have body cams and a lot of our <laughs> patients don't have health literacy. Oh. And so the things that happen, um, patients don't even know that what's happening is wrong. And that has been something that has kind of, um, <laughs> had a big negative impact, I would say on my daily life. That's a huge one. That is a huge one. Yeah. How do you overcome that? Like how, what are they doing to help you overcome that distrust? Um, so that one's a little trickier. I will say it's been amazing to just talk through this with a third party. Um, and what I'll say is that I think there's a lot of like thoughts on like from people in general that if you're in the healthcare profession or you're a first responder if you're going to go to therapy that you should have someone that's in that world like a, a culturally culturally competent provider um and emergency resilience if you guys don't follow her on instagram i will totally plug her because she's amazing <laughs> um she she talks about this where like there's just simply no need for that like therapist a good therapist is more than qualified to handle your shit like they deal with some terrible things like she in one of our videos she's like i'm pretty sure they can handle your pediatric cardiac arrest like they deal with some terrible things and so it's been really nice to talk to a completely impartial third party about these situations and talk through the things I'm seeing. Um, you know, do I do that with my husband? Yes. Do I do it with my friends? Yes. But this is different. And he has encouraged me to start looking for the positive in healthcare and which seems simple, but when you walk into a room on a regular basis, and see things managed terribly and you have to become the fixer, it's so easy to become focused on all of the negative that we see. But you know, sometimes we walk into a room and things are actually managed well, but we don't really remember it because it's just an easy normal call or an easy normal flight. And I have been putting a lot more effort into like actually logging those experiences. And when I have a friend or a family member that has a good experience with a doctor, I try to like really concentrate on that and pay attention to it and pay attention to the things that like doctors and nurses and other clinicians are doing well, because those things do exist. They're just not the things that stick in our minds so yeah. easily. Yeah, I can, I can totally agree and relate to that because it's easy to it's easy to show up right when we're picking up one patient and the ER might have six or seven other also critical patients and you're like this patient was just completely mistreated mismanaged what are you guys even doing like thank god we're here to take them away this person needs to get away from here you know it's easy to do yeah. that it's really easy. Yes. So that is a very good perspective. And to remember that, you know, not everything that we take is critically ill and are managed correctly. Yeah. And like you kind of alluded to it, but there's so much perspective to consider, you know, like you said, we walk into the room in our perspective and we have the incredible privilege to have one to one ratio, two to one ratio, right. Yeah. On a flight crew. Yes. Um, you know, you have one patient that you get to focus all of your energy on. And we have to remember that that's not the case in an emergency department. It's not the case in an ICU. Um, and probably most importantly, no one's trying to hurt a patient, right? The majority of the time, everyone is doing their best. And so we have to remember that and, you know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt uh, within reason, right? If, if there's truly negligent care going on that needs to be addressed. But most of the time people are doing their best and trying their best. 
Sure. No, I totally agree with that. That's a fantastic response on that. That was great. So you had talked a little bit about how you volunteered in high school. First of all, I have suggested to multiple people on this program that I wish we had some sort of program or development in high schools where kids could go and get their EMT basic just to kind of have an idea, right? And so that A, so that we have more people who know how to do CPR and then B, so we have more people who know how to do first aid. Is that something that your high school offered? No, but it does exist in my area now. Oh, fantastic. So what I did is I joined my local firehouse and then took a volunteer EMT class um, on nights and weekends. So it was like the week and then, you know, all day Saturday or whatever. So it was actually in addition to my normal um, coursework, whatever you call it in high school. Um, But yes, now there are a couple local schools and stuff that actually do have that as an option built in to their program. That's so cool. That is just a really neat idea and a really neat program. Did you graduate in 2006? No, 2008. Oh my gosh. So you started like young, young, because you were, that was what, 16, 17-ish? Yeah, you can't take the class until you're 16. And so oh at 16, I was knocking on the door. And so I... I don't really know why I always knew I wanted to do this, which is odd because when you're like 13, 14, I don't even know how you understand what this is really, (laughs) but I was always into watching like ER and gory Mm -hmm. shows like that. And so my, my mom, you know, drove me to the firehouse because I didn't have a license yet. And, uh, (laughs) and I, I joined and they got me into the EMT class and I started running calls immediately. And I was there all the time. I was there after school. I was there on weekends and it was a very rural um, department. So we had a super low call volume, but long transports and a couple really good mentors that, um, that taught me a lot. Yeah, it was, it's an interesting age to get your feet wet and start dealing with, with some of those things. But I think um, it forced me to mature a little bit earlier yeah. than I think I otherwise would. And I think at the end of the day, it was a really good thing for me. Yeah. Well, wow. That is a very, very young age. And I, cause I started at 18 and I, I was a senior in my high school and got into the fire department. I was actually doing the academy at the same time as my senior year in high school. So that's really impressive that you started at 16, but that can also kind of go into the same concept to how you were talking about that health anxiety I can relate to that. But even as a young age, I was, I was thinking like, I didn't have the cleanest room, you know, but I would always leave a path because I didn't want my parents to trip and fall and like break their neck when they're walking into my room. You know, I remember thinking that at a very young age. (laughs) So I've always been kind of aware of that. And I can, I can totally relate to yours. It never fails. Like I have to drive down about three and a half, four hours to go visit family for the holidays. And I'm constantly like, I know that we have to drive. Uh, My brother-in-law has to drive and we all drive in separate cars. So I'm just constantly thinking like, what happens if there's an accident? What happens if something happens and I'm not there? Like, you know, I I feel that and I understand that anxiety. And I'm wondering if that didn't start with having started at such a young age. Well, and I think it's so important to talk about this because I think so many of us do what I did for what, however many years it's been like thinking that's normal. Like that is not normal to walk around thinking like that. I will say for me, I know what what started first was an absolute hard stop no to drinking and driving because of the amount of drunk driving deaths and accidents I saw at a very young age. And so even before I was legally allowed to drink, right? I mean, my whole life, I have never been loosey goosey about that at all. I do not drive intoxicated under any circumstances. And I think there's a lot of people who probably have on one or more occasions, you know, than they would like to admit and, you know, that shit happens. But um, like for me, I remember from a very young age thinking I will never, ever do that. And for some reason, like, you know, there's different calls that bother different people for different reasons. And mine have kind of changed throughout the course of my career. But in the earlier stages of my career, for some reason, it was those like young deaths from substance um, involved accidents. And I think it's just because it felt so like, 
unnecessary and like accidents happen, but those accidents don't have to happen. And so when you're seeing, you know, like mangled dead bodies under a car, that's like, you know, their teens or 20 years old that at that age, probably cause I was close to that age at the time, that is like what, what hit me the hardest. And so I think I am like appreciative of that kind of health anxiety at a young age where I learned that like stupid games win stupid prizes and you have a choice to not play those games. Sure. Yeah, no, I think one of the first dead bodies I ever saw was my dad at, uh, I was 16 and he's a cop and he said, you want to see what drinking and driving does? And he showed me pictures of this, this, uh, it was an SUV that had been driven by a teenager and there were three other teenagers in the car and they were all drunk and he flipped the SUV and it had actually rolled over two of the people who had gotten ejected. Like basically the three passengers all died and the driver survived and took off from the car. And that was what the pictures he was showing me was these dead teenagers all up and down this ditch embankment where he'd rolled. And I just thought, oh my God, like that's so, that's so fucked up. That's so fucked up. It is, right? But, you know, honestly, I agree with that parenting because that is life. And, like, how old were you when you did that? I was 16. I was 16. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's a good age. Okay. You're good. You're good. <laughs> I Seriously. So, um, in all seriousness, the first call that – so, probably the only real – I won't say the only, the worst bout of like true PTSD symptoms I ever had stemmed from the first um, death I ever saw. And it was two young guys. I actually don't know if there was alcohol involved in this one. It was just speed as far as I know, but two young guys in a vehicle, um, middle of the night, they, they wreck, they flip the car, like lands on a fence. And the post, I guess, punctures the gas tank or something. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know how cars work whatever (laughs) something made it explode um and become fully involved and there was a deputy that was driving by and saw this and was able to pull out the passenger but the driver was impaled with a fence post through his um torso and he was fully incinerated in Mm. the vehicle and so i am either 16 or 17 at the time. Now I'm not sure. And it's the middle of the night, it's pitch black. And so, you know, you can't get released as a, as an AIC until you're 18. Right. So at this point, I'm just, you know, like I'm a trainee, I'm hanging around doing whatever. So this is my first like, Oh shit call that I've been on. And I just remember standing in the middle of the high, the two lane road that's shut down and looking at the car and saying, is that a dead body? And one of the senior providers being like, yeah, what do you think it is? And I just started sobbing. I had no idea how to handle this because the dead guy's best friend is getting flown out in a helicopter in the company I work for now, which is crazy. Um, (laughs) And he's screaming about his best friend, right? He's screaming his best friend's name. He's like, we'll call him Pete. He's like, go save Pete, go save Pete. You know, just screaming about Pete, screaming about Pete, like go save him, go save him. And you know, Pete's dead, right? And so I'm on the scene with an incinerated body, by the way, completely, you know, head to toe. He had like one piece of flesh left on his foot. I specifically remember that with a fence post through his abdomen, a best friend screaming, a helicopter landing. I was so overwhelmed and I was fucked up for probably like two months after that. I was not sleeping well. I was performing very poorly in school, which was not like me. I was performing poorly in my sports that I was very, very good at. Um, I was, I was asked and I, I remember going to my school counselor and talking about it briefly, but I don't think that was anything that was sustained, maybe one or two sessions. And, you know, eventually it just passed and I got over it, but having that type of experience without any real preparation and without any real like support system in place was tough. And I remember telling my mom about it. My mom starts sobbing because she's mortified that her child has been through this, right? Like it's just a whole mess. And, you know, at the time that was back when they still did like the kind of traditional like CISM that has kind of fallen out of favor now, but it took probably two days for them to do that. And I was, at the time I felt like I was forced to do it. Now I realize like, obviously I could have said no, but I felt kind of forced into it. And at that point, I felt like I had had these two days 
to like kind of start to process things and figure things out. And then we're all sitting in a circle in the, you know, back hall of the firehouse and the CISM people person comes in and makes me like talk about my feelings and I lost my shit again and I start sobbing and I felt like it only made things worse. I don't, I didn't feel like that helped me at all. But yeah, I mean, that was my, that was my kind of like rude awakening introduction. But honestly, after that, like it kind of ripped off the bandaid. Like I've had some like rough shit after that, but nothing really kind of impacted me the same way that did because I just, I don't know, I guess I just like learned how to deal with it and how to, how to move on. Yeah. It's an interesting dynamic, right? Because how could you have been better prepared for that scenario? Right. At your age, nobody wants to tell a 16 year old, you're going to be seeing dead bodies. Guess what? You're going to see them burnt. You're going to smell it. And you're going to hear family yelling in the background to save this person who cannot be saved no matter what you do. Right. And then you're clearly not dealing with it. Well, the fire department, I don't know what they're doing in between that to help you, but then they force you into a position where they're like, hey, talk about it in front of everybody. (laughs) Embarrass embarrass yourself in front of your peers. Make yourself look weak in front of your peers. Like, hey, you need to do this and I'm going to force you to do it. That's uh, that's a pretty interesting way to handle. Yeah, all of that. That's exactly what happened. Totally appropriate account there. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, do do you think that there's any way to better prepare a teenager if we were to implement more and more of these programs into these high schools, is there a better way to prepare these kids? Oh, that's tough, man. I don't think I have a good answer to that, honestly, because there's so much of this that you can't be prepared for until you experience it. But I think what has to be in place is the support system afterwards. There has to be an outlet for mental health, for easy access, therapists for ways for people to do this anonymously for them to do it one-on-one it has to be something that it becomes more normalized in our culture because i mean back you know 2006 2007 i know that wasn't that long ago in the scheme of the time that a lot of people have been doing this job but even at that time that was not a thing like people didn't go to therapy and talk about their you know their bad calls and their health anxiety or whatever um so i i don't think there's a lot that people that can be done to prepare someone for their first experience like that but the support system has to be in place afterwards to take care of the aftermath so that people can move on and continue to be a productive member of the team and i think you're likely to get that if you are in like a volunteer fire department at a young age or if you're in a fire department at all i think you're probably more likely to get that kind of experience but for somebody who's in a high school like that's hard to that's hard to imagine but i i interviewed another paramedic program coordinator and he told me that in his classes he actually like the students have to go to a counselor before and then during while they're on their clinical rotations. Is that something oh, that, wow. yeah. Is that something that you think that you would implement? Oh, I would have to think about that. I would have to think about the logistics. Um, I, I like it. I think that introducing people to therapy is fabulous. And I think that's one way to do it. But I also think that it's a hugely personal experience. And I think that if someone feels forced into it, it's potentially going to turn them off from it. Sure. Like I, for years and years felt that I absolutely did not need therapy, that I handled my job and my shit just fine. And I think that if someone had told me that I had to go, I would have gone, but I, I'm not sure how much I would have gotten out of it. And I'm not sure that I wouldn't have developed a little bit of like, I don't know, disdain towards it. Um, versus when you come to the conclusion on your own that it's something that can benefit you, I think that's a a whole different world. Now, I'm not saying for sure that that would be a no from me. I just, I'm not sure. It's an interesting idea. I agree. I think it is a very interesting idea. I think, and I don't think it's a bad idea necessarily. I do. I think that if you are utilizing the words, you know, force or you have to do it, um, you're right. That would probably promote some disdain within those feelings. But I think- I think in general, maybe not even necessarily a one-on-one session, but maybe having group sessions where you're sitting in a circle and you're all talking about it 
Um, I think that'd be great. I mean, if you're if they're having to sit in those classes anyways, not to say that there isn't a lot of information that has to get taught in a very short period of time, but maybe taking that half an hour to an hour and just sitting down and having like a group chat can be very therapeutic as well. I think that's a really good idea, actually. You know, I hadn't thought of that. And I think that's kind of a brilliant approach to make it, you know, basically a big group therapy session, maybe even a, you know, few times throughout the program yeah. early on throughout the middle and to the end where students can talk in a group about both their experiences with the stress of the class but also their stress of you know also their job and their family and anything maybe they've seen on clinicals um I think that's amazing because then you're also not forcing anyone to talk if someone wants exactly. to sit there in silence they can sit there in silence and yeah I think that's a it's a really good approach that I might have to explore we'll call it the the noon <laughs> We'll call it the yes. noon hour or something. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's clever. <laughs> um, so I know you said you're the paramedic program coordinator. Do you also do EMT basics and intermediates or advanced or anything? I don't. I, I have before, but I don't so much anymore. No, see, that'd be another good idea to get the EMTs with the paramedics and have those conversations at the same time because EMTs, and I don't know how long your guys' programs are. I think out here, if you're not in a certificate program, the the whole paramedic program is two years. Yeah, ours, it depends. So I work for a private company that kind of caters to like the organization that wants the class. So like the one right now that I'm coordinating is like a year and a half, um, but they actually have some very sped up programs that are, that are like nine months. Mm -hmm. um, B2Ps, which no, I don't agree with, but yes, I do teach them. Um, so yeah, they're pretty short out here. And I think that's one of the big downsides is you know not having a ton of spare time for stuff like that. But I think that there's always time for something like that. Right, exactly. Um, it, taking an hour here and there is not is not a huge deal. Yeah, providing like a lunch break for the day and doing pizza and just sitting around, you know. I think I'm going to start making some proposals. <laughs> yeah, I think you should. I think it's a really good idea, truly. I agree, I agree. So you've been doing this for a very, very long time. Uh, kudos to you, by the way, because you have a very good outlook. You're very positive all the time, and that's great. It's great to see providers that are like that because it's so easy to watch providers go from being like great positive and then into this like just crusty medic scenario where they are getting run to the ground, you know. And I and I've talked about this a little bit too. Once you're in that flight position it's nice because you're not getting your ass handed to you. You know, you're doing one mission, one patient, and that's lasting between three and four hours, depending on where you're flying to or whatever. So you're not getting a, a call an hour like some of these ground crews. When you were working on the ambulance, how did you stave off the crusty medic? Yeah, I have always felt that you get to choose your perspective on this. And I when I tell you, so I told you, I like totally nerded out, right? When I was in high school doing this total dweeb, people told me from day one, you're going to get burnt out. You're going to get sick of this. You're going to get burnt out. I never did. Then I went to college and I spent, you know, 40 hours a week at the rescue squad there at a very busy agency. And people told me, you're going to get burnt out. You're going to get sick of this. You're going to get burnt out. You're going to get sick of this. And I never did. And so then I started working for a career agency and I loved my job. I loved running calls and people were like, you're gonna get sick of this, you're gonna get burnt out. And I never did. And I think it's just, there's so much that you get to choose and how you see things. And it's like, every single job has its bullshit. Every single job in the entire world has its bullshit. And so if people go into this job thinking that every single day is gonna be full of some hero shit and some sick ass people, like that's an absolutely asinine mentality. The majority of this job is problem solving and customer service and helping people with like simple stuff, right? Like once in a while we get to do some medicine that maybe makes a difference, but that's like such a small majority of the time. You know, if if your expectations are in line and you make the best of what you have, then I think that it really like affects your 
your outlook on things. Like you can get mad that Meemaw called you at 3 a.m. for falling and not being able to get up. Or you can realize that at 3 a.m. Meemaw feels like she literally has no one else to call. And that's fucking tragic. And the best thing that we can do is just be a nice human and help Meemaw up. Like we're literally getting paid to be there, right? Now, what I will say is I went through a period of crusty, crabby medic that had nothing to do with patient care, but had everything to do with the fact that I worked for an organization that I loved with people that I loved with call volume and acuity that I loved for a boss that treated me like absolute dog shit. Like the worst I have ever been treated in a workplace in my entire life, like to the point where you're like, how can someone that treats humans like this still be employed, but then you realize that you work for a good old boy system and you know, it just, it is what it is. And it's been that way for a decade and it's gonna be like that for another decade. And that turned me into a sourpuss. <laughs> that turned me into the most negative version of myself that I have ever been. It didn't have anything to do with the patients or the patient care. It was working in an environment where I was not seen. I wasn't appreciated. I was literally harassed, not sexually, but like verbally harassed in a workplace. Um, and it was just allowed to happen. And it happened to other women in my workplace as well. So at that point, that is when I made this decision that I had to leave. Like I, there was no choice that this, this is not how I want to live my life. This is when I have how I want to feel coming to a work to work at a job that I love. Um, and I, I left, I left after, you know, dropping a giant HR bomb that was years overdue, um, for that person. Right. And, uh, well-deserved on their end. But I think a huge part of this job is these toxic workplaces. And we have to realize that like, to some degree it's under our control and we can leave. And I know that's easier said than done because we all have salaries and families and homes and places that we live. And that can be difficult. But like, if your job where, who are you working for is making you a miserable human being, there is no reason to stay at that place. Like you are never going to make a toxic workplace better. It's only going to make you toxic. Like it only goes one way. Yes, you can try your best to contribute and chip away at the culture, but at a truly toxic organization, the odds of you flipping that place around single-handedly are slim to none, but the odds of that place turning you into a miserable crotchety human being are pretty fucking good. So just get out and go find a place that makes you happy. Right. Very well said. Very well said. Do you know if anything happened to that person after your HR bomb? Oh, that's a whole other story that I, I won't go too, too detailed into it, but here's what I'll say. I had years. And when I tell you, let me just be clear, you know, the world doesn't know me. A lot of the world doesn't know me personally. I have never gone to HR for anything in my entire life. I don't have problems with my fellow employees ever. I don't have problems with bosses. This is not like a repeat issue for me. This is one single issue that I had like ever in my life. And it was huge. I had documented dates, times, witnesses, things that were said, policy violations, like a whole list of shit that this human had done to me personally. But I also knew there were other things that had been done to other employees. So I took it to HR. HR was like, oh my God, this is terrible. I can't believe it. We're going to launch a whole investigation. One month went by, two months went by, three months went by, six months went by and nothing happened. And I just felt like I shouldn't be surprised. And so I ended up before I left, when I put in my, my notice, I CC'd the county administrator, the county attorney on a very well-written professional email, not to toot my own horn, but it was a good email. Um, very objective without any emotion about what had happened, what I had experienced, what I had, what process I had gone through, what I was told was going to happen and what didn't happen. Then I, then I FOIA'd the entire investigation and sent all of the documentation to all the females in my department so that when they, after I left, when they started having similar experiences, that they had all of the documentation from my very hard work on this <laughs> um, 
to to defend themselves. Um, and I had actually met with a lawyer at one point that said that I had a case if I wanted one, but I made the decision that that's not what I wanted to do to myself and my career, and that's not that that's not the route that I wanted to go. Um, I wanted to get the fuck out of there. I wanted to go to a healthy workplace and I wanted all the females behind me who were experiencing the same thing to have the ammunition from what I had started. And um, eventually not having to do with me directly, that person did end up leaving. Um, and in between the time where I left and then conditions had apparently reported reportedly improved um, somewhat. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, did it really do anything? No, it didn't. It it made me feel better. It made me feel empowered to speak up and say something. It empowered some other people in that organization who had never said something to step up and say something too. And, you know, I have really thick skin. I, I'm not one to bring about, you know, quote drama like that. But after four or five years of dealing with it on a regular basis, I had fucking had it. And I have no regrets about the way I handled it. Good. You shouldn't. No, more power to you. Honestly, like that's fantastic. And you had said, uh, you had mentioned earlier that it's, you know, it's easy. It's easier said than done when you're telling people to go and find another job. And I will tell you that it, uh, this is hard and I don't want to offend anybody, but it is a lot easier for a nurse to do that than a paramedic to do that, right? Because in a paramedics Absolutely. world, we're very limited to where we can go and we don't have the travel options that a lot of nurses have. You know, there are ambulance companies everywhere, but do I really want to pick up my family and move to a different state because I'm not being treated fairly enough? You know what I mean? Like that's a hard, it's a hard one. 1000%. And it's so legitimate. I just think it's a matter of like priorities and what matters the most to you, right? Because like for me, if I had stayed there, I would have destroyed my mental health. I would have probably destroyed my relationship, probably wouldn't have done great things for my friendships. I wasn't the type of medic or employee that I wanted to be or coworker that I wanted to be. So like it it's just it's up to the individual right are those sacrifices worth it like are you truly willing to be like miserable in that toxic environment is that better than the alternative and in some cases maybe it is and that that sucks and i i recognize that that is a reality for some people but i also think that like man social media paints ems as like this profession where everyone is miserable and everyone gets paid pennies and it's all this like terrible stuff. But a while back, I did a post where I asked people to submit to me, like I've done a couple, one agencies that provide like really good mental health resources for their people. And then one agencies that people love working for and places with good pay. And I actually got a ton of responses from people who are like, my employer's awesome. They treat us so great. Our culture is amazing. We have mental health resources. We get paid however many dollars an hour. Like these awesome salaries, these awesome cultures, don't get me wrong. I understand that the industry in general is fucked up in a lot of ways. We have a lot of problems with education, with culture. Those things are realities, but I don't think it's as pervasive as like social media and all the memes makes it seem like there are are good places to work. There are people that get paid well to be happy to go to work. And so I think a lot of people who are saying they don't have options may not have actually put in the effort to truly explore what the real options are. Yeah, no, yeah, it's fantastic. And then it goes into like, you stay with what you know, right? And if this is all you know, you're staying because you're afraid because it's not always greener on the other side, right? So what if where you go is worse? And that's terrifying. It is terrifying. But you know what's funny? The perspective that job gave me. So now in my current program, I love my program. I love everything about it. And you know, no matter where you go, people are going to have complaints, right? But I work with people now who complain about like management and leadership at my current program. And all I can do is laugh because I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> no one at this job has ever 
pulled me into an office and made me cry multiple times in one week. Yeah. Like no one has screamed in my face for not telling them good morning. Like the things that are quote problems here are absolute jokes compared to the, the problems that I had in a previous life. And so I, for one, I know everyone has different experiences and sometimes the grass is not always greener. But for me, I was like, this is paradise and nothing can ever be as bad as the previous situation was and I appreciate that <laughs> oh well I'm so like I'm so sorry that you had to go through that previous experience but I am like super happy for you that you've gotten into this position where you absolutely love it you're loving what you do that just that makes you so much better of a provider and it makes it better for your patient care and your co-workers who don't have to deal and with you being a miserable asshole <laughs> <laughs> yes Yes, exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> you, again, we go back to this, you've been doing this for a very long time. Um, what would you say has been like your favorite call in any location that you've worked? Yeah. Um, this is, it's kind of an interesting question, right? Because like, it depends how you think about it. Cause I think about some of the like really impactful calls. I had a like a 19 year old sudden cardiac arrest that we got back super fast, like full mm -hmm. recovery. Those types of things are awesome. Remember like a VTAC, uh, conscious VTAC patient that, you know, like we cardioverted and got a thank you letter and like that's super cool. But like, honestly, the calls that impact me the most in a positive way are the ones where you get to make like a huge interpersonal difference rather than a clinical difference because i think that the impact tends to be like a lot more significant and a lot longer lasting so like i'll share with you one call as an example of this and i shared this on social media at some point as well but years ago we were called for a suicide where a young man had got onto the roof of his building and he had, his parents were sitting in a vehicle in the parking lot and he was on the phone with them and he was on the phone with them um, basically telling them what he was going to do, but telling them that it had nothing to do with them and like that he was so thankful for them and his loving family. And, and then he, he shot himself. And so the fire department gets there and he's, his body's on the roof and they go up and they confirm that he's dead and they're extricating the body and, at the time, my service, we were responsible for transporting bodies to the morgue. We used to do that regularly. So we were on scene waiting for that. There was, and the parents are in the car. There was a woman from the neighborhood, I guess, standing on the sidewalk, just staring at the, the son's body being removed from the roof, just staring. And the mom is in the car watching this lady who she called the gawker, right? Um, the gawker, just gawking at her dead son being removed from the roof. And she is, the mom is super upset about this. Obviously she's distraught. Now she's distraught that her son's being used as like entertainment. So I talked to law enforcement on scene and they went up and talked to her, but they were otherwise preoccupied. Um, she wasn't technically doing anything illegal. She didn't want to leave. And, and that was that. So she kept gawking, right? So I'm watching this mom get like progressively upset and I'm talking to her about it. And so I just decided to go over to this woman and like have a stern but professional conversation with her about, you know, hey, I would hope that if you were in this position that you would not be, you wouldn't want to be treated like this, right? Like you wouldn't want someone staring at your loved one, you know, being removed. This is the worst day of their life, yada, yada, the whole thing, right? And the lady ended up, um, that lady eventually ended up leaving after that conversation. And once the son was removed from the roof, the parents wanted to see him, but law enforcement said no. So kind of, you know, negotiated a deal with them that, hey, can we put him in the body bag, zip him up, but they can come in and touch him and like have a moment with him through the body bag. And law enforcement said, okay. So that was that, they came in, they had their moment. We left the scene. I didn't think anything else of it. Well, maybe like a week or so later, I come into the rescue squad and there's like a pot of flowers and a two page handwritten note waiting for me. And it was from the mom. And the mom wrote two pages to me, thanking me for allowing her to like have, I like still get choked out talking about this, like allowing her to experience this without 
she literally said, thank you for handling the gawker, right? And like, thank you for letting us say goodbye to our son and thank you for giving us the closure that we needed. And it was just the most like, I could not believe that someone who was experiencing probably the worst loss of their entire life, right? Like the loss of a child had the energy and the willingness to write a complete stranger a handwritten two page note and drop off flowers to say thank you when I didn't even do anything to help save her son, right? Like that was done. She was just thanking me for the interpersonal like relations that happened on scene and the things that happened. And I was like so taken aback from that. And I remember at the time I was like a little bit, a lot of bit burnt out and um, feeling just, I was feeling burnt out. And that letter single-handedly like completely turned me around and made me feel like like this is why we're here doing this like we have the opportunity to help people in such unique ways that transcend so far beyond patient care whether it's just being holding someone's hand or providing a death notification in a kind loving respectful way or just being there for a mother who just lost her child like that and letting her say goodbye like these things we have such an opportunity to make an impact in like such unique circumstances um those are the calls that are the most positively impactful for me like that to me will always outweigh any good clinical care and it's something that's not taught a lot i think like in the paramedic classroom but I try to talk about it a lot because I think it's it's so important and the majority of our job is talking to people and not actually doing medicine. I agree. And that is a powerful, powerful story. Uh, you were a person. You weren't an EMT. You weren't a firefighter. You weren't a paramedic. You weren't somebody just hanging out, doing their job. You were a person. And that is hard to find. That is hard to find with people. And I'm sure even the gawker probably appreciated the way that you handled talking with her, you know? So thank you for your service. Oh gosh. No, I mean, <laughs> like, and at the time, I honestly didn't even, I didn't even think anything of it. Right. Like, I just thought like, this is how you, this is like, there's nothing I can do to help bring your son back. So, so like, what can I do to help? And I think that's a mentality that I think a lot of people do truly have. And the people that are passionate about this job and love this job, we get on calls and flights and whatever. And we just think like, how can I help? And sometimes it's medicine and sometimes it's something completely unrelated to medicine, whether it's calling a family member or, you know, moving a piece of furniture that the patient tripped over or, you know, or finishing the task that they were trying to do before they got hurt, like, or making them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or whatever it is, like this mentality, this is what I love the most about the job. I like helping people and I think this job offers you the opportunity to do that on almost every single call that we run, no matter what the acuity is, you can help somebody in some way. And so if you can find the joy in that, I think that contributes significantly to career longevity in this job. Sure. I agree. And I think a lot of people forget too, that that's why we're there. You know, you talked about the Mima who calls at three o'clock in the morning because she literally has nobody else to call or doesn't want to upset family. Right. But we are that resource and we just need to remember that we are there for the people. Right. This is why we do this job. Yeah. Sometimes we get to do cool things. Like you said, clinically, we might get to to cardiovert somebody or we might actually ha get to have a return of spontaneous circulation. But it's so far and, and few, you know, but I think this is such a thankless job, too. And it really is that when we do get thanked, it is impactful for us. That's so true, you know, and it's like, you know, you never... I don't think any of us are in it for the thanks because if no. we were, we wouldn't be here because yeah. it hardly ever happened. <laughs> yes. um, but like, it is, it is cool. Like, you know, especially in a situation like that where it's not even clinical and it's, you just, it's a, it's a reminder. I mean, I still have that letter. I kept it in my work locker for years just as a reminder, like being a human being matters the most in this job, like human first, clinician second. Yeah. No, I agree, 100%. Do you think that being as passionate 
as you are on the job prevents you from being as passionate at home? Like, do you suffer from compassion fatigue at all? No, I don't. I don't, I wouldn't say at home. Um, I think in life, like I, I definitely, you know, people will always say, I always see people say like, make sure you have friends like outside of your world, Mm -hmm. right. Outside of your, your work world. Honestly, fuck that. Like for me personally, I can't listen. (laughs) Like some people, the majority of my friends are in some way or another in this type of world. What I can't stand is, you know, like the friendships where you try to talk to someone or you tell them about like what happened at work or whatever. And they're like, oh my God, like that sounds so terrible. And it's just a run of the mill call or like, you know, people are, you know, complaining about their version of problems, but you literally just did CPR on a dead baby and you're having to like negotiate feeling like empathetic for the friends, yes. but like also that like people have bigger problems in the world. And like, I personally have just developed a circle of people who there's like an understanding and I, I don't feel compassion fatigue because I feel like we're all kind of like on the same page about things and are like, like, yes, we all complain about our petty shit. We all have our small problems. Yeah. I'm not implying that at all. Um, but I just feel like I've surrounded myself with a group of people that understand and not all, they're not all first responders by any means, but they are, they at least are in a world where, where they are empathetic to what I do and I'm empathetic to what they do. And I think I'm just a passionate person in general. So I've got plenty to go around. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. I constantly, if I'm at home, I tell everybody I'm not working today. I will call 911 for you if something happens, but that's as far as it's going. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) So they all know, are you going to work today? No, (laughs) no, I'm not. Yeah. And you know, that's kind of funny, right? Like that's almost a different issue where I, I hate talking about work in my personal life. Mm -hmm. Like I'll come home and I'll like, I'll talk to my husband about my shift or whatever and give him the rundown. But like, if I'm out at a social event and you know, especially if I'm with someone on an outer circle and they ask me what I do, like I start with, I work in healthcare and hope that I can get away with that. Like that's the end of the conversation (laughs) because you know, I love educating. I love talking about like medicine on Instagram and I love teaching in the classroom and I love my job. But when I am like actually outside of that, being a normal human being, which I do do, believe it or not, like when I'm being a normal human, I, I like to turn all of that off. I don't want to be talking about medicine, about flights, about calls, about healthcare, like none of that. And that is such a nice thing to be able to do to just like go out and completely separate yourself from that part of your life so is your husband in ems or any type of he's launched okay so he's an elio okay so my wife is not in medicine and i enjoy that thoroughly like none of my (laughs) none of my family is in medicine so it's nice and i don't have to go around and talk You know, if I want to share a story, they're open to it, but I don't have to. And that's really nice too, because when I'm off of work, I am off of work. I don't have to worry about having those conversations with anybody. That's huge, right? And like, I think that's, I appreciate that so much about my husband because he gets the world and like he gets the lifestyle. And so I can very easily communicate with him about things. And I also would argue that he's probably a better EMT than a lot of actual EMTs because <laughs> he reads all of my posts and, and I educate him on things. But at the same time, he's not in my world and it offers a nice space where there is like some difference and I'm not completely drowned in it all the time. And um, everyone, everyone has their own needs in a relationship for yes. sure. But it sounds like, you have found a good balance and we definitely have as well. Yes, no, that is fantastic. Um, so you had talked a little bit about not having PTSD. Uh, do you feel comfortable sharing maybe one of your worst calls? Yeah, I think I think like what is someone's worst call depends so much like on the person. And I kind of alluded to it earlier that different calls bother different people for different reasons. and. 
I have found that a lot that like on Instagram, people will reach out to me and be like, oh, I feel like embarrassed that this call is bothering me because it seems to them like it's like not quote, not a big deal, but it's like, if it strikes a, a nerve with you, it strikes a nerve, right? And like, I've had a few over the years that have bothered me for different reasons. Um, there was one, well, let me back up. I think there's also, I ha, there's even more subcategories, right? Like I personally rarely feel responsible for a patient's outcome in a negative way. I am very in touch with like what I can do and what I can't do. And like, I'm okay with that. Like there's some things I can fix and there's some things I can't fix. So if there's ever a situation where I feel like I could have done something differently that would have impacted the outcome, that is very traumatic for me and rare, but traumatic. And then the other category is things that feel too relatable and too close to home. So for example, in the first category, couple come to mind. One, I was a fairly new medic, um, but I was a preceptor. I don't know. I'd maybe been a medic for a couple years, but I was too green. I should not have been a preceptor at the time. And we had gotten dispatched for an overdose and we got there and it's an overdose, but like peri arrest and the patient had a horrifically compromised airway and needed an airway immediately. And I made the decision to allow the student that was with me to try for the intubation and they were unsuccessful. And during that time, the patient ended up coding. We never, we never got the patient back. And that one stuck with me for a really long time because I felt like that was a totally inappropriate move on my point on on my part to make that a precepting call. I should have known that that was never a precepting call. When when someone is that that ill and needs something that urgently, the most experienced person needs to be doing it, especially when you have a very new student that's with you. So that one that one stung for a long time because I even though I felt deep down that probably that patient already had an anoxic brain injury, that there was probably nothing that we could do by the time we got there, I was always left questioning if I had managed the airway myself first and I was able to get it quickly, would the outcome have been different? So that is kind of like one category um, of that type or one example of that type of patient. Then there was another one in recent years that I won't go too much into detail about, but the gist is that there was, we had a, a days old patient, very tiny patient. The situation had been escalated unnecessarily, in our opinion, before we got there, that resulted in probably unnecessary airway management measures that were failed repeatedly, um, not by us and by the sending facility. And the patient ended up dying um, pretty gruesome, pretty gruesome death. Um, and we ended up like working that that arrest and being a part of it. And that one was probably my worst call in memorable history, like in recent years, because even though this was an inner facility where uh, my partner and I were not fully responsible because there were there were actually multiple physicians um, involved in this situation. I was a very green, uh, an even greener, I should say, flight provider at the time. I was like in, like probably a year in at the time. And while I know it wasn't my fault, I think that if I was the provider I am now, that I would have been far more aggressive in stepping in and possibly stopping the cycle of absolute chaos that was occurring in that room. I don't know for sure that that would have happened, but I know I know for sure that there's multiple things that I would have done differently to try and intervene. Um, and so that was really hard because that felt like a totally unnecessary neonatal death. Like it felt it felt like it should have never happened that like just thing after thing like snowballed and went wrong and was handled poorly and i felt like i maybe could have done something to stop it and i didn't i didn't know how to at the time um so those are some of the hardest in that category as far as like the patients that you relate to i have a sibling with autism 
Um, years ago, I had a, a pediatric drowning code. It was an autistic child who CPS had been to the house like the week before and declined to remove the child from the household who was then, you know, neglected and ended up dead, drowned in a pond. And we ended up getting Rosk, but of course he was, he was brain dead. But that one was exceptionally hard for me because having an autistic sibling and understanding like the challenges and like what that means for the child and the family and the effort that that takes and knowing that this child had known deficiencies in the household, but, you know, wasn't removed rightfully or rightfully or not, I'm not sure. Um, that one was also particularly difficult. So I would say like, those are the two categories of things that bother me the most when it feels relatable to someone in your life and it feels too close to home. And then the ones where you feel like you could have, should have, would have done something differently that might've made a difference in the patient's outcome. You're so very well-spoken and I appreciate, I'm so glad that I reached out and asked you, kind of forced <laughs> you to come onto this podcast today. <laughs> no, um, you did not. <laughs> Uh, the drowning one, that one's hard. I'm really sorry that you had to deal with that any, in any circumstance, whether that kid had autism or not, you know, that CPS is something that we see a lot out of, out of here, uh, child abuse, unfortunately in New Mexico has really high, high numbers, which is just absolutely terrible. We've talked about it on the podcast quite a bit, but that's just so unfortunate. Um, I don't know if you want my two cents or not. I'm going to give it to you anyways. Sorry. Sure. I would love that. Um, <laughs> As far as the the neonate code, um, you know, I have not been doing this much longer than you have. Um, I hit my five years as a flight paramedic this year, and I can tell you that when you have a good partner in place, you know, and you're walking into a situation that is a mess like that, there's no guarantee when you walk in that those doctors are going to a respect you enough to step down or b even consider you to be you know as smart as you actually are so had you had the wherewithal to step up and say something there's a really good chance that they would have told you to get the fuck out you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> like there's a really good chance it is insane Sometimes you walk in as a flight paramedic and everybody's like, oh, thank God they're here. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh, finally, you guys are here. Take this off my hands. I'm leaving the room. This is yours now. Like, you know, and then sometimes it's like, well, you're questioning everything that I'm done. You're questioning everything that I'm currently doing. What do you even want? You're going to do things and you're going to do it wrong. So you're going to do my orders. Here are my orders for you to take while you're on this flight give these medications and you're like, um, okay, whatever you say, I will listen until <laughs> I'm out the door and then I'm going to do what I yeah. want to do anyways. So thank you. Um, as far as the neonate, I don't know what was going on. I don't know why the patient coded. I trust your intuition though. If you're saying that that patient was, uh, had airway management done too early, it very likely was done too early with neonates, it's hard to say, you know, sometimes it's too early and then sometimes it's too late, but I really, I don't think if there were that many doctors that you would have had any opportunity to step in and take control of that situation. Yeah. You know, see, why am I paying for therapy when I could just be talking to you? <laughs> right. Um, that, but, that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, like it's, those are such valid points and they are all things that I have considered, but I think what bothered me the most about that one is that there was a chance, right? Like there was there were things that I could have done that could have made a difference. Would they have? Very good chance not, right? But like when you have to like show the specialty doctor like how to use their own equipment, it's yeah. like maybe, like maybe if I had like forced myself in there and been like, hey, I'll do it. Like maybe they would have been glad to give it up, you know, or someone like in that situation, that room had spiraled into complete chaos that someone needed to call a timeout. And I did not have the confidence or the experience or the wherewithal to do that at the time. But in hindsight, I would have demanded a timeout. That doesn't mean that I would have necessarily done anything, any of the skills, but we would have all taken a breath. I would have stood on a chair. I would have said it. We would have taken a breath. And we would have come up with a better plan than what was being what was being executed at the time. And so those are the things that eat me up. But like 
I have zero regrets about any of the mistakes I've made ever in my career. And that's because mistakes are going to happen. Right. They are unavoidable. And while you can learn so much from a classroom and from reading and from a preceptor and training, there are some lessons and a lot of times the hardest lessons uh, that you can only learn by fucking up and experience. And, you know, it really sucks when it's at the expense of a patient. Right. And like, there's a difference between making a mistake that was totally avoidable. Right. And something that was, you know, negligent or just wrongful care. Um, that's different than just wishing you would have done something differently. You're, you're telling me this, but then you tell me that you're being you like, you're upset or you're, you're, I can't remember the words that you used, but it yeah. bothered you that when you were a preceptor, you let that EMT or that student intubate, right? And that's the exact example that you're telling me that you should forgive yourself on. And it's totally right. Honestly, dude, like if I had been in that situation, I would have let that paramedic intubate also, because you know what? In six months when they're on their own, they're going to have to do that. They're gonna to have to have that pressure. They're gonna to have to do it themselves. And that's part of being a preceptor is you have to be able to relinquish that, that I could have got that tube on the first try, you suck. Like, you know what I mean? Like you just have to be able to let that go. And I think that it wouldn't have changed anything. I think that's possible. I do think that my perspective has changed on this a bit because I used to be the preceptor that gave everything to the student. I said, this is, you do all the things. And I think whether it's right or wrong, that call taught me, and I do firmly believe this, that not every call is a teaching call. Because if that was, that situation is not the best example because I do think that patient was pretty far gone probably at the time. I was just left with like some question. But some of our patients, like if my mom is in the back of an ambulance and her life literally depends on a procedure being done correctly, like her life actually depends on it, there better be the most experienced person doing that. Like the patient comes first, right? And like, there's gonna be more opportunities for more tubes and more IVs and you know, more whatever. Um, I think there are, there's a specific patient population and situation where the patient comes first and they deserve the most experienced clinician in the room. I don't think it's often. I do think like you can you can safely help and mentor students through most situations, but once in a while there's a circumstance where that patient deserves the the best shot that they can get. Right. And did you did you make the second attempt or did you guys just drop an extra glottic airway? Yeah, I think, I don't even remember what happened after that. She ended up with a, tube, with a tube eventually. I don't know if it was me or another medic that that rolled up on scene, but I remember we had actually also tried, we had Kings at the time, we had tried a King airway and she wouldn't take that either. I think she, she had like a profuse amount of vomit. Um, this was so long ago now, the details are kind of fuzzy, but um, she I do specifically remember that we tried dropping a King, that didn't work. She eventually ended up with an ET tube, but it was, it was so late. Yeah, well, don't let it chafe you too much. I just, I know you said you've thought about it a lot. I just, I don't think that it would have changed anything from my perspective. Yeah, I don't think so either. And that one, that was, that was, uh, a while ago now I have moved on from that one right that was um earlier in earlier in my life but I do think it's just important for everyone to understand that like everyone has the types of calls that bother them and like yes. it's okay um and it's okay to like be upset and be sad about it for some amount of time but you know if it's eating at you too much and you're thinking about it for too long then maybe it's time to go get some help right so I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the big things that we've talked about a couple times, which is imposter syndrome. Uh, you made a post about it not too long ago, and I think you've shared pretty much how you feel about it, but why do you feel like you have imposter syndrome? Oh my God, I have so much imposter syndrome. And honestly, Instagram has made it so much worse. Like I feel... <laughs> I, you know, on Instagram, what people see 
is like well thought out curated information where I like research and I talk to people and I double check things and like I look things up and I put it in this nice little package and I deliver it. And it it makes people think that I'm this like brilliant clinician who like just pulls these things out of her brain and, you know, plops them, you know, and it, I feel like it kind of puts me on this pedestal that I don't feel like is appropriate, like that I don't deserve. Um, and that I didn't earn, like I, and I've said this a million times that I am not the best clinician. I'm not the strongest clinician. I work with so many people who are so much smarter and so much better at their jobs than I am. I fuck up all the time. I do dumb shit. I make stupid mistakes and I try to be as open as I can be about that on social media as well. Because like the last thing I ever want anyone to think is that I'm this like perpetual wealth of like all of this knowledge and I know all of the things and I'm good at everything. And I, I don't mess up because all of that is so fucking untrue. Like <laughs> that is so untrue. I literally embarrassed the fuck out of myself with an A line yesterday in front of an ICU nurse. I broke the whole thing. I was like, Oh my God, can you please get me a whole new setup? Like she, I know she thought I was an idiot. Like I, this stuff happens all the time. And so like, I've always had it where I feel like I, people, I feel like people have like high standards for me and I'm afraid of not reaching them. And I wish they had low standards and I could just like excel over them instead. <laughs> I would rather like, like exceed a low bar than not meet a high bar, if that makes sense. But yeah, it's something that I deal with like on a literal daily basis. So I just try to be as honest as I can be about what I know and what I don't know and the mistakes that I definitely make. See, and I think that does make you quite a brilliant provider because you're going out of your way to learn all of these things. And we talked a little bit about it earlier, that the amount of research that has to go into all of these posts that you're doing is insane. So you're saving all of these clinicians like two or three hours per post <laughs> and just research, right? Because you're putting it all out there and you're putting in all of the research information. So you're citing that information, which is fantastic. Amazing work. And I wish I could like reach out and smack you for feeling like an imposter because you shouldn't. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. The difference between a good provider and a bad provider is that a good provider will say that they messed up. Right. We have so yeah. many situations right now where things are happening and people aren't confessing to those mistakes. And that makes it worse and that makes it harder. And that puts your patient in jeopardy, you know. So strong work. A lot of kudos to you. Please don't feel like an imposter. You're doing amazing, <laughs> amazing work for real, though. Like, Lindsay, it, it truly is inspiring the amount of work in you say that you don't want to look stupid, but you have picked a perfect platform because you do get to put it all in writing and you're not dumb like me doing a podcast where you sound like an idiot every five <laughs> seconds, you know? <laughs> now you're doing great work though, for real. Oh, uh, I appreciate that. And I think like, it's also so important to work for a place that, that embodies just culture because yes. like, you know, talking about mistakes, I had gone my whole career, knock on wood, without a medication error until I was in probably my second year flying and I made one. I misprogrammed a pump. I It was poor communication. I asked the nurse, I was like, oh, this is mLs per minute, right? And she said, yeah. And I didn't like triple confirm it with my partner and I plugged it in and it was supposed to be mLs per hour. And oh. I ended up both. I ended up bolusing a drug um, that did, should not have been bolused. And thank goodness it, it did no harm to the patient, but we immediately reported it to sending. We reported it to receiving, To the, went through all the appropriate channels. And like, I was so appreciative that I didn't get punished for that, right? Like yeah. I was honest about it. We were, we told everyone immediately that needed to know. Um, and I was mortified that it happened, but I was so grateful that that happened in a situation where it didn't cause detriment to the patient because it has, I'm sure, undoubtedly prevented me from making other med errors afterwards mm -hmm. because I, 
going forward was so much more meticulous and like triple checking everything that I was programming in these pumps and making sure that the nurses knew what they're talking about. The doctors know what they're talking about, that someone didn't slip up and say the wrong thing. And like, I very easily, if that mistake didn't happen, I could have made a different one that actually caused significant harm to the patient. And so I try to find like the good in every mistake and the silver lining and just thinking that every mistake you make, you get to cross it off the list and it's only going to help patients after that. Agreed. No, that's fantastic. And it's good that you're so open about it. We need more people that are like that. So be open about your mistakes, guys. If you have, if you fuck up, please admit it. Like just get it out of the way. Most companies won't punish or be punitive about these mistakes as long as you're being open about it. So Lindsay, I just wanted to give you a couple of minutes if you wanted to talk about anything specific on the podcast or if you wanted to mention any um, resources that you have available. No, I think we covered honestly so much of my like passion points today. Honestly, my biggest takeaways for people are one, take care of your mental health. Like don't wait until you need it. And this is something that people were telling me on Instagram in mental amidst mental health conversations for so long saying like, get yourself a therapist before you need a therapist. Right. And so I feel like that is what I've done. Like I, I went for more maintenance, right? I didn't have any like huge PTSD issues. I had some things I wanted to work through. We talk a lot about my anxiety, but like I love now having this resource that I have created a relationship with that is available to me. And just the other week I had a call that again, just hit close to home. It felt very personal to me. I was very upset by it. And I was so thankful that I had a, therapy appointment in two days to talk about it. So I just encourage people if they're thinking about it, just like, just take the leap, give it a try. And then the only other big thing here, I think, and it's kind of like what we just talked about with mistakes is that we all are able to help change the culture that we work in when it comes to mental health, to making mistakes and to elevating the profession. And so like, all we need to do is just set the example for the people behind us, right? So like when it comes to treating patients with kindness and respect, like that's a cool thing to do. Like, let's set the example and do that. You know, being the burnt out asshole provider, that's not cool anymore. Like that's, that doesn't make you like old and experienced and, and knowledgeable, like treating people with respect is like the cool thing to do. Um, and there's just so many opportunities for paramedic education that like the smarter we make ourselves, like the more we elevate the profession as a whole, right? Like I love being like, quote, just a paramedic that knows things, right? Yeah. <laughs> I feel I feel like I am capable of providing really good, intelligent care to patients a lot of the time. You know, yes, I fuck up. I always have things to learn, but like in general, I feel like I'm pretty good at my job. And the more people that are willing to be quote, just a paramedic, but be really fucking good at it. Every single person that does that helps elevate the profession. So I love seeing like more people viewing it that way. And being open to making this job more of a true like professional career because there's some aspects of it that we can't control, but there are a lot of them that we can. So we might as well make the difference that we can. I agree hundred percent. That is fantastic. And Lindsay, I appreciate you coming on so much. Like what a great fucking conversation. <laughs> it was really good. I feel like I should pay you for this. <laughs> How much do you charge per hour? Let me think about it. <laughs> no, for real though, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you coming out so much. Thank you. Thank you for today. And I, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Of course. Thanks for reaching out. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Before we wrap up, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Firstly, we're excited to announce the launch of our brand new 911 Nonsense Facebook group page. It's a community where everyone can go to connect, share ideas, discuss topics from the show, and get all of the most recent updates about the podcast. We'd love to have you join us and be part of the conversation. Next, we want to ask you to rate and review our podcast on your preferred platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach a wider audience. 
By rating and reviewing the show, you'll be supporting us in a big way and helping others discover 911 nonsense. If you enjoy what we do and would like to support the podcast even further, we have a few options available. You can visit samspursuit.com to find the links to our 911 Nonsense merch page and our recently released Noon Gear page. Every contribution, no matter the size, goes a long way in helping us continue to better the podcast. We know that not everyone is comfortable being on the podcast, but we still want to hear your stories and experiences. If you have a compelling story and would like to share it to be read by me in a future episode, please reach out to us via email at 911nonsense at gmail.com or through our website's contact section. If you choose to be anonymous, we'll make sure to respect your privacy while sharing your story in a way that resonates with our audience. Thank you again for tuning in. We truly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more engaging content in the future. See you next week.